Okay, this is David Zeller, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021. Once again, it's my great pleasure to be back with Professor Edre Goins. Edre, is always great to be with you. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Edre, last time before we were rudely interrupted by a power outage, you were explaining a quite dramatic narrative transition in your educational trajectory where you were seriously considering leaving Caltech. And the very last thing I heard you say was you were in a meeting with Tom Apostle and that changed everything. And then we went silent. So first of all, what did Tom say and why did it change everything for you? Yeah, let let me maybe try to to back up and go to the slightly to the beginning of of all of that, at least so I can get my own mindset into what we were saying. Um, Freshman year, I was taking this honors calculus class that Tom Apostle was was teaching. And the idea is that if you had done really well on the homework assignments, you could place out of the final exam. I had placed out for the first two quarters. And really, during my second quarter, I wanted to work with him doing number theory. We spent a good amount of time in his office of Project Mathematics chatting about some things that I had been reading about. Remember, I had this book by Harold Stark on something like a classical or modern introduction to number theory. I don't remember the exact title, but there were a lot of things there in the book I didn't really understand. So I would go to Apostle's office, try to chat about various things that I was seeing. I even had some ideas of how I could generalize some of the concepts that were there. But by the end of that semester, I really, by the quarter, I wanted to do research with them and kind of continue some of the projects that we were discussing. So one day, it was a Friday afternoon where we had just finished class. I spent part of that week writing up a surf proposal. And all that I needed him to do was sign it. I was going to walk it over to the surf office immediately right after class. And then hopefully work with him that summer. Well, at the end of class, when I handed him the surf proposal, he looked at it, but then said, I'm sorry. I really don't understand what it is you want to do this coming summer. So, of course, I was a little bit shocked because we had spoken about this for weeks, probably five to six weeks at at this point. Um, And I thought that it was pretty clear that I wanted to work on properties of what are called binary quadratic forms and some of the multiplicative properties there. But he told me that because he didn't really understand what I wanted to work on, he did not want to do research with me, and he was not going to sign this proposal, this application to be sent to the SERF office. Of course, I was devastated because the proposal was going to be due. The applications to serve were going to be due within the next, I don't know, three hours or so, which meant that I was not going to do research that summer. So this was halfway through my freshman year. I was seriously considering being a mathematics major. I really thought I was doing well in his class since I had placed out of the exams, was getting nearly 100% on the assignments. I came to each and every lecture. We had spent weeks and weeks talking about all this, but if that wasn't good enough to convince him to do research, I didn't really know what was. So I really had to think hard whether Caltech was where I wanted to be and whether mathematics was something I wanted to do. Um, Earlier that year, I had seriously thought about transferring to UCLA. I had gotten an application in the mail, was filling it out. I eventually decided not to apply. But the point is that still, I was really wondering whether Caltech was really the place for me. I definitely liked the classes. I didn't really like the lack of social atmosphere that that was there. And math and physics were two things I was certainly interested in. Apostle was only one of two people in the department doing number theory. So I knew Apostle was out. We weren't gonna work together. We weren't gonna do number theory. So if I wanted to continue in number theory, I had to think about working with this other guy that I hadn't even met yet. And so it it was really kind of a scary thought halfway through my freshman year. Should I stay at Caltech? Should I stay in mathematics? And I was very, very much in the edge of leaving. Edre, if I can just note here, the questions that you're dealing with seem to be primarily of an academic nature. On the social side of things, and this again goes back to your naivete not really thinking about the lack of integration at Caltech, how diverse it was. So my first question there is, you know, today we have diversity training and we have officers in diversity and there's all sorts of messaging that conveys 
at the institutional level that diversity and inclusivity is important across the board. So circa the early 1990s, was there anything like that at Caltech? Aside from the individual level, the professors, your colleagues, your friends, your stu the students who were supportive of you, was there anything at the institutional level where you received the message that people who looked like you were valued at Caltech? Um, absolutely not. Um, you know, this was during the days when there wasn't any kind of diversity office. It was before the days of the Women's Center. Lee Brown was the only person that really had an office and he had student support programs. That's what it was called, SSP. So it wasn't even like a diversity office. It really was thought of as there were a handful of students that are here on campus. This one office, which essentially had no funding, was the office that was supposed to help out this handful of students. But there was nothing else on campus that, that I'm aware of. What, what did that make you feel? On the one hand, Lee Brown did a very good job when we were all in high school of letting us know what we were getting ourselves into. You know, he, he did, made it very clear, Caltech is going to focus on academics. It wasn't going to focus on whether or not you wanted to have parties or have a girlfriend or hang out and be social. It didn't even care whether or not you were going to get along with your professors. It was about you had to work really hard, get really good grades, and hope and pray that you were going to graduate. Now, that, that was pretty much the pep talk that he gave us all coming into Caltech. So I knew that it was not going to be a friendly place. I knew this walking in. I don't think that I was really prepared for how one-dimensional Caltech was. Mm -hmm. you, you know, a lot of it came down to professors and the students only focusing on what you could do when it came to academics. And we're not even talking about whether or not you're getting the best grade in the class or whether or not you know how to do the homework assignments. It was more this pecking order of who's considered to be really smart and who isn't. Um, and that was really a depressing thing because I think that some of us had a lot to bring to campus that would have made it a much better place. But really, it never felt that the campus in general appreciated that. Um, one story I'll give you is this. You know, I mentioned that um, Eddie Grotto came to campus and he took over for, for Lee Brown. Um, the guy who was in the admissions office was Dan Langdale. Now, Dan Langdell, if I remember right, he came in 1989, and he wanted to have a very different admissions class, a very different freshman class. That's where the, whatever, 12, 14 Black students came in there in 1990, because he was really big on, on that, that class. My understanding is that he also fought to bring Eddie Grotto from MIT, where Dan Langdell, Dan Langdell was coming from. So here we were, freshman year, uh, we knew that Eddie Grotto had come from MIT, but we didn't really know much about the admissions office. Dan Langdale had dinner for all of the freshman minority students. He, his wife was there. He also invited Eddie Grotto. And remember that most of us on campus didn't really know Eddie at the time. We definitely didn't know Dan Langdale. But there must have been about 20 of us there at the house. And of course, all very awkward Caltech freshmen all kind of standing around, not really knowing what to do. But the one thing that stood out for me that evening was Dan turned to us and said, I want you to all know why I admitted you. Um, it started by saying, all of you were affirmative action hires. Sorry, affirmative action admits. Now, some people took offense to that. But Dan continued by saying, the way I view affirmative action is by bringing in individuals using criteria that isn't your standard criteria. I didn't just bring you all in because you were really good at academics. I brought you in because I knew that you were going to change the culture of this campus, that you all are coming in from very different backgrounds. You have very different perspectives. And these different backgrounds and perspectives are sorely needed here on this campus. He went on to say, all of you are leaders and movers and shakers. I saw what you did in high school. I saw the organizations you were a part of. And now I put on to you the charge of doing the same thing here at Caltech. That speech that Langdale told us, 
actually really stuck with me for the next four years. I saw it as my responsibility, not just to be this one dimensional person that was just gonna focus on being a really, really good student and being a really good scientist. But I really saw it as my responsibility of changing Caltech for the better. And it was all because of this one speech that Dan Langdell gave us there during freshman year. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say that it made my life any easier to kind of like decide that I was gonna take on that charge my freshman year, but it gave me a very different perspective of what it meant to be at Caltech. And I think that that perspective really helped me survive through the place. You know, after everything that happened with, with Apostle, I did have to do some serious soul searching of, do I really wanna be at this place where I understand it's gonna be an uphill battle, not just in terms of academics, but also in terms of the lack of social life that I'm going to have. There was never any question whether I could do it. I certainly knew that I could make it through Caltech, I could graduate and I could strive. I wouldn't just survive, but I would actually do really well at Caltech. The question really was whether it was gonna be worth it for me to sacrifice the four years. But, but I will tell you that hearing Langdale give us that speech of him saying, you are movers and shakers, you are here because you are to change this place. That definitely is, is what, what kept me inspired. Edre, these communications, of course, are overt. You're hearing these things loud and clear without any nuance whatsoever. What about what we might call today like microaggressions, either from professors or students, you know, comments that might seem innocuous but can be deeply, deeply hurtful, assumptions that maybe you're not a student, you're a staff member, maybe you're there for athletics, things like that. Did that happen to you also? It, it did. Um, I'm going to have to kind of go back in 20 some odd years so I can actually kind of remember everything that, that happened. Actually, I guess it is 30 years now. Um, there were various things that happened even as early as Frosh Camp, you know, when we all went to Catalina Island. Um, when we did the equivalent now of FSI, this freshman summer thing that lasted for about six weeks or so before classes started, I would say that we, we got along pretty well as a group. We were having some very awkward conversations of what it meant to be a minority, but you know, all of the minority students were there together. We, we bonded pretty well as a group. Our first real test of being Caltech students was going off to this freshman camp. I remember in particular being a little bit nervous, somewhat anxious by seeing all of these brand new students for the first time. You know, we're talking probably 30 of us were on campus for about six weeks, all kind of working, living together. And then that 30 then ballooned up to about 200 plus people when we were all supposed to go on the boats to Catalina Island. One thing I remember is wanting at one point to listen to rap music. Now this is back fall 1990, rap was not something that was part of the mainstream. Um, MTV made it a point to refuse to play rap videos. Um, UMTV Raps was delegated to like Friday evenings for like a half an hour show because they wouldn't play any videos the rest of the time. Um, rap was not played on the radio at all. But this is something that of course, I had grown up with in Los Angeles. And when there was maybe like one or two parties happening there at Frosh Camp, I remember requesting to the DJ so they play something. But the DJ looked at me and said, I'm not gonna play that crap. And just told me to go away. So the next day, I don't even remember where I got this from, but I got a boom box and decided that because I had one or two rap tapes that I was gonna walk around the island there at Catalina and play this loud boom box and the music that, that I was used to. That gave me a lot of nasty looks from people. You know, me kind of walking around, but you know, people wondering, what is this music? Why is he playing all of this? But I really did that in defiance. Um, that was really my first introduction to knowing that the culture that I was used to was not going to be welcome at Caltech. I can't really remember a lot of other microaggressions. It was probably, it's probably just been blocked out of my mind over the years, but certainly issues such as 
walking into some of the buildings in the evenings, getting stopped by campus security, being asked to show an ID, me kind of wondering, it's the middle of Caltech's campus, who else is going to be in here, like, you know, dressed like a student, 18 years old, walking into this building, but it didn't matter, you know, being harassed, stopped all the time. Um, the rap music thing was was the thing that happened for all four years. It, it essentially never got played at any of the parties. And whenever I would come in with like, you know, a, a tape or a song I wanted to play, no one ever wanted to listen to it. Um, and one, another point, I lived in Ricketts and I put up outside of my door the information about the old Negro Leagues, the baseball leagues. It was something I just got really interested in when I was a sophomore. Um, and so my junior year, I just decided I was going to wear baseball jerseys that had some of the unique league players. And outside of my door, I would have just information about like, you know, who was this player in the history and what have you. And I know that those were not well liked in the dorms. You know, people wondering why I was being defi divisive, why I was putting these things outside of my door. Um, so that there were a lot of minor things like that, just lots and lots of minor things. The only awkward interactions that I can think of at the moment that I had with faculty members. And I'm still debating with, to this day whether it was a good interaction or a bad interaction. I was taking ACM 95. At the time, we called it AMA 95. But, you know, this is the class that discusses mathematical methods for scientists. And for a lot of students at Caltech, it's probably the scariest math class that they will ever take. For me, it was my most favorite math class. I um, ended up getting an A plus in this class. And, you know, there were only maybe two Black students in this class altogether. But the professor for this class, he and I hit it off really, really well. I could tell he really liked me. Um, and I don't even really know how we first hit it off. I think we just started to chat outside of class a little bit. And I would see him on campus. And sometimes we just kind of walk places. Um, but I do know that right about the time I was taking AMA 95 was right about the time the L.A. riots happened. So, of course, people did not know how to discuss race. It was just something that people just didn't do, and it was just not clear how do you bring it up, how do you talk about it. So I remember this professor and I did actually have different conversations about race. Um, for example, the movie Malcolm X by Spike Lee had come out right about that time. For me, this was the big, big movie. I actually saw it three times in, in the theaters. And this professor and I actually would talk about like the movie Malcolm X and about the person and what have you. So it did feel a little bit awkward that here I was, this older white professor who was teaching my applied math class. You would think that we'd have no reason at all to talk about anything other than applied math. But just one day he just brought it up and we would just talk about it somewhat casually. Um, and again, I'm not really sure if this was a, a good thing or a bad thing. But I know I definitely enjoyed the conversations that I had with them. Um, so yeah, there, there were a lot of things, but yeah, probably if I think about it more, I can come up with more stories. Hey, Jay, do you have a specific memory of the Rodney King beating and where you were at the time? Yes, yes, I do. This was during my sophomore year, if I remember right. And I was not having a great time at Caltech. Um, you know, I definitely was a math physics major, but I just really wasn't happy in the math building, wasn't happy in the physics department. I definitely wasn't happy living with people there on campus, but I was doing what I could to kind of make it through. Eddie Grotto's office, the equivalent of minority student affairs was in the middle of campus at this point, there was a small building um, which was located, I believe, between Page House and Lloyd House, kind of right where the mailboxes used to be. Um, and I think like it might have been um, Director of Residence Life lived there for a while. I'm not completely sure. Anyhow, it was a very small office and Eddie had his office there. This office was so small, it was large enough that Eddie had his desk, there was a secretary at the front door, and that was it. There was really no space even for students to hang out. But I remember hearing about the Rodney King meeting, watching the video, knowing that the trial was going on, and just feeling that 
all of this kind of craziness is happening, nothing's fair and, and, and what have you. Um, the day the verdict came out, I went over to Eddie Grotto's office and I remember all of us just feeling really depressed. First about the fact that the verdict was going to come out kind of knowing that it wasn't going to be positive. And second, actually just watching everything happen. But now remember in general there at Caltech, people really didn't know how to talk about race. So it wasn't like it was being discussed in the dorms. It, it wasn't, nobody was talking about it. I didn't really know Eddie Grotto very well but being able to go over to that office, the fact that he had this on his television, at least made me feel comfortable enough to kind of bring it up with him and, and chat a little bit. So I remember being there in his office, watching for a little bit, knowing that the verdict came out and watching Tom Bradley, who was the mayor at the time, go on this press conference with Rodney King standing right next to him saying, we know that you're not happy or at least we know that you're not going to be happy with how the verdict's gonna come out. So please don't riot, please don't do anything crazy. Just let's just try to survive through this. Of course, watching the mayor freak out about that, knowing I knew that something was not, something bad was going to happen. So I went back to my dorm, turned on the television, and there I could see some of the newscasters reporting that the verdict came out, people are not happy about it, LAPD was on alert, but at the time I was watching television, the local station. I was also listening to the black radio station out of Los Angeles. This is something I had done every day anyway, because I grew up with this radio station. So I was kind of watching both at the same time. The TV stations were saying that they were kind of worried about maybe some of the riots that were starting to happen in downtown, but they really phrased it more as people are starting to go crazy in Los Angeles. The black station on the other hand was reporting something totally different. They were saying that, for example, um, a lot of the stores were closing early. They noticed that the police cars were actively leaving South Los Angeles and that they were actively telling people that on the radio, get off the streets, things are not gonna be good tonight. You know, Try your best not to act crazy. Then I saw on television, there was a guy in the middle of an intersection being pulled out of his truck and it looked like that he was being beat up by a few different people. Now, the rest of the world knows this as Reginald Denny who's being pulled out of his truck right there in the middle of the intersection. I recognized that instantly as the intersection that was about two miles away from my house, two blocks away from my house. I recognized that right away. So I called my mom on the phone because, you know, it looks like it's total chaos for what they're showing right there on, on television. She doesn't answer, but my brother answers the phone. And he says that he can see all of this happening essentially from like the back of the house, because like he can actually see Florence and Normandy just a couple of blocks away. He can see that there's helicopters flying overhead. They also know that the police had totally pulled out of the city. He also said that a lot of this craziness was localized right there to Florence and Normandy. Like even half a block away, it was perfectly fine. There was nothing happening. But he also said that this isn't what they were showing on television. So I knew that there was a lot of craziness happening right there in the neighborhood that I grew up in. I knew that my mother and brother were probably not in the safest of situations, but of course there was really nothing that I could do. So I continued to do all the rest of this for the rest of the night, you know, kind of watch the television, but really with the sound turned down low, then also listen to the black radio station and kind of hear what's really happening there in the community. And it's a completely different narrative kind of like watching the two of these things happen. What you see on TV is almost like hysteria and just kind of madness and mayhem, just people breaking windows and looting stores. Whereas if you listen to the radio station, they made it very clear, almost all of that was localized to downtown Los Angeles. The rest of South LA, people were staying inside that they really didn't want to go out. A lot of people in the radio were talking about the similarities with the watch riots back in the 1960s. You know, there was also a lot of discussion of why people were really unhappy with the verdict, why they were also unhappy with what's happening in South Los Angeles. So I spent pretty much the next several days watching this dichotomy, listening to the radio station, but also kind of watching without sound everything that's happening on, on television. As I went to class, though, during the day, I would hear people talk about what was happening but there was no sympathy at all towards what was happening in LA. 
Um, for example, in my humanities classes, I remember students saying things like, the people in LA where all this stuff is happening should be shot, that they got what was coming to them, they got what they deserve, um, they can't believe why people are ripping up their own communities. Now, remember them saying all this stuff, they're saying this about the people that I grew up with, about my family and, and relatives and, and all the rest of that. But since I'm the only Black student at Caltech who's from South LA, you know, no one really has any, any sympathy behind all of this. Doug Flaming, who was the person teaching some of these humanities classes, he was very good about having people to kind of back up a little bit when they were saying some of these insensitive comments. You know, he definitely wanted them to speak up and speak their minds, but he was saying, you know, you can't really say things like those people should be shot because some of those people are here in the room. You know, this, these, these kind of things. So I was very grateful that Doug Flaming understood that, that this, this was not, not a comfortable situation for me. Um, but that, that whole week, watching the students at Caltech just be so vicious to what was happening in LA, and then being selfish, saying that they were scared to death that all of these riots were going to come to Pasadena, when there was absolutely no way any of this stuff was going to happen because it showed that they didn't understand why that was happening in LA in the first place. It, it caused me to really despise the fellow students at Caltech. Um, it was a really hard year watching all of those comments go through, watching students say what they were saying. And then to think that these are the same students that I'm supposedly taking classes with and calling my friends and living in the dorms with, just realizing that there was this disconnect between what they viewed as people in LA and the reality of the people who were there. Um, and I can't say that I ever really got over that, that experience back then. Andrea, of course, Pasadena is only a few miles from South L.A., but you must have felt like you were on a different planet to some degree. I did. I did. Um, yeah, you know, growing up, we all knew that Pasadena was a very conservative white city. Like, I mean, you know, like, like my mom and I would joke about this growing up. You could turn on the Tournament of Roses parade and kind of see things like, you know, like, like the Rose Court, and it would pretty much, you know, just be completely white every single year. You know, growing up in L.A., you see the Rose Bowl parade every New Year's Day, every single year, and you just understand that if that's really emblematic of the city, the city must be a totally different world from what's happening in South LA. So in me moving to Pasadena, I was very much aware that the city itself was not the same city as LA. I think what surprised me was realizing that Caltech itself was a very different world from anything that I had ever seen. But a different world and, and, and not in a good way. You know, students that really did not have any real connection to the rest of Los Angeles, that they, they really saw it as people that were beneath them. And that, that was something that stuck with me. Edre, as a coping mechanism to deal with this very difficult situation, when did you find it healthy for yourself to be out in front of the issue, to say, you know, to confront people, to to correct them of their misperceptions, to tell them when they're they're acting in an insensitive way. And when did you just want to close up the shell and not want to deal as much as possible? So I never worried about correcting people. You know, as far as I'm concerned, if that's the way that you're going to think, I just don't really have any any interest to interact with you. I focused a lot more on what was happening with the Black students at Caltech. Um, you know, this is where I did a lot more work with the equivalent of the Black Student Union, you know, with the Nesby chapter, this National Society of Black Engineers. I spent a lot more time trying to make sure that the Black students were graduating, that they were doing well, that they were doing well in their classes. I remember signing up as the Dean's tutor so that I could really get paid to tutor as many of the Black students there on campus as I could. Um, ironically, the California Tech, the student newspaper, wanted to run an article on what was happening in Los Angeles, you know, with the riots and Rodney King and, and what have you. But as I've mentioned several times, race wasn't something that was discussed at Caltech. One of the reporters eventually found out that I was a Black student there who was from South LA. 
And so they wanted to interview me on exactly like kind of what we're talking about now, about growing up in L.A. and why the riots are happening and what it's like me, be, me being there at Caltech. It was a very awkward interview because I wasn't really interested to, to talk about it. I almost felt that this was exploitative, exploitative. Exactly. You know, that they they wanted to feature me because it was a nice narrative. You know, black student from Caltech is has riots that start just two blocks away from his house. So the article ran and people read it, but I was never happy with it. Not not so much ha not happy in what the reporter said, more in that it was exploitative. Um, I was much more interested in making sure that the other black students at Caltech were healthy and were surviving than I ever was in helping Caltech come to its racial reckoning. Um, there were some people on campus who wanted to have discussions about the Rodney King beating and about police brutality and about the riots that were taking place. I remember at one point during that entire week, the kind of all the riots were happening in LA, that there were people that put up various posters and flyers around campus saying that they wanted to have like a discussion about Rodney King and, and about all of this. Some of those flyers, a lot of those flyers were actually torn down and people were just saying in general, they're in the dorms, they didn't want to have discussions around this. That they were very angry that all of these things were happening in Los Angeles. And just seeing that vehement response to wanting to discuss what they were seeing on television also made a big impact on me. I realized that this was the one opportunity, probably the first opportunity for many people who attended Caltech, that they really saw race up in front in their faces, but they did not want to talk about it at all. They really went out of their way to make sure that they weren't going to talk about it. And so I didn't want to be a part of that. That's when I, I made the conscious decision, I am not going to spend time engaging students at Caltech about race. I am only going to engage the students of color to make sure that they, they survive. So it, it's an ironic thing, but I don't think that most people knew. I really had no interest at all talking about being a black student with other students at Caltech. I had a main interest in making sure that the other minority students were gonna graduate. Andrew, what did you learn about yourself in your natural inclination to worry about other students of color? I think I learned that I was a natural leader. I also learned that I had a lot of patience. Um, and I learned that, that I was a very good listener. Um, the minority students at Caltech were all coming from very different backgrounds. They have very different perspectives. Some were from inner cities and they really took it personally to see the police brutality that was played out there on television. Others had never been around minorities before, and they themselves did not know what it meant to be a minority. So being at Caltech, they were closeted. They were very uncomfortable discussing any issues dealing with race or even what does it mean to be a minority student. I had to learn how to interact with those two extremes. You know, specifically chatting with Black students that wanted very much to have rap music played at parties. And they very much wanted to, like, talk about their African non-slave names kind of thing. Students who wanted to go off campus to go see Malcolm X, the movie. Also to deal with those students who had never been around other Black students before, who actually were uncomfortable when I would come say hello to them because... They had never interacted with anyone Black before, even though their parents were Black. And these same students, I had to figure out, how do you get them into one room so that we can all kind of work together and be a part of this organization? That took a lot of creativity, but it definitely took a lot of patience. Because this, I learned that I was really good at it. Because this required coordination, was there anybody 
on staff or in the faculty at Caltech who were supportive of this effort, who, who helped you wherever they could? I would say that there, there were a handful of people. Um, you know, of course, the main person was Eddie Grotto. You know, he, he was very much in front of this um, first day freshman year. So he was always supportive, always there at the meetings, always said that if you needed money or anything, you know, that he, he'd be the first person to help out. There also was the secretary that was there in Eddie's office, Michelle McClanahan. And, you know, she was wonderful. She was amazing. She was definitely always there 100%. In terms of some of the other faculty, um, there were a good number of faculty in humanities and social sciences and HSS who were 100% there. Of course, Doug Fleming, even though he wasn't really there for the meetings, he was definitely my rock. You know, I would go to him with different ideas, things that I was thinking about. And he was certainly 100% supportive. He's the one that would kind of let me know about maybe different activities happening on campus, if there was a speaker coming by, you know, just whatever. I do remember in particular, when the movie Malcolm X came out, he actually drove myself and another person to South LA to go see the film. And, you know, it took like, whatever, 45 minutes to get over to the Crenshaw district to go see the film, but we went to go see the film. And, you know, and I was really grateful that the duck was willing to do that. Um, there were a few other people over in humanities that I just remember that they were always there supportive. Um, Morgan Kauser was one. And I still think it's ironic that I've never taken a class with Morgan Kauser, but he was just someone that I could just show up to his office. And he was certainly, well, is certainly one of the most liberal and just politically active people that I know. So it's kind of like whenever I was just feeling just really frustrated about things, I can go talk to Morgan and he would just kind of get me riled up and just like get me motivated to do even more. Um, there was a visitor named Bryant Simon and I believe he was visiting maybe for a year, maybe two years, but he was basically visiting working with Doug Fleming. And Bryant was someone that he and I just had wonderful conversations the whole time that he was there. I consider him to be my second advisor because he was really the one that was the main contact when I did my surf project on the history of, of black students. Um, over in the physics department, you had, um, oh God, what, what is his name? Steve Frouchy, who was just wonderful. So I met him when I was at freshman camp for the first time. He's the one that kind of convinced me to stay in physics, even though I really wasn't happy in the physics department. So I would just see Frouchy all the time. He would just come to dress dinner over at Ricketts. We would just hang out, chat about this or that. Um, yeah, I really can't say enough great things about Steve. Steve is the reason I went to Stanford for grad school because I would just ask him, where should I go? And he said he liked his time at Stanford. He thought I would too. So it's the reason why I went. There were various people like that. And I know that there's at least a dozen other people that I'm forgetting about right now. Um, there was a support network is what you're saying, though. It, it was, but it, it was a rather odd network. I don't know how many of these people knew each other. Yeah. You know, HNSS, they knew each other. But say, Doug, I don't know if Doug Flaming knew Steve Frouchy. I don't know if Steve Frouchy knew Eddie Grotto. Um, there was even another woman over in geology, Jean Reynolds. And my understanding is she was one of the Black women on staff who had been at Caltech the longest, something like maybe 25 years by the time I got to Caltech. But I don't think that Jean knew Eddie or Doug or any of the rest of these folks. So in me kind of becoming that leader, I just got to know a lot of people from all over campus. Like you named the department, I pretty much got to know someone there. So I got to know the people who were allies, and I also got to know the people who tried their best to kind of put a hold on everything. But the funny thing is, in learning these different pockets of campus, I also learned that they didn't know each other, that there really wasn't any one concerted effort to say, have all of us work together. I kind of got the feeling that a lot of those people that I interacted with, they saw me as the glue because they knew if something was happening, I would let them know about it. So they all know about the Nesby chapter and if things were bad were happening in the minority student affairs office, I would happen to be in their office or I would just seek them out and just tell them this here is happening. This is what's going on. I don't really know if that ever kept up after I left, after I graduated. Um, but that's probably the one regret that I have is that even though I was really happy that I was interacting with all these faculty and staff and we had this nice coherent network that I could never find a good way to make that permanent, that all of these people working 
would permanently be working together. Andre, of course, now after the year 2020 and the decision on renaming with Milliken and others in the eugenics movement, was that on your radar at all as an undergraduate? Were you aware of this connection that Milliken and others had to, to the eugenics movement? Was anybody talking about that then? No, no, absolutely no one's talking about that. Jeff, understand Caltech was just a very, very different place. You know, Caltech had his gods and you didn't talk bad about his gods. You know, we're talking people like, you know, Milliken and Feynman or what have you. You just didn't say anything negative about them. Um, ironically, the fight that we had in our day was making Martin Luther King's Day an institute holiday. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That that was our serious fight. I would say that probably, you know, grad students like Sarah Sam, kind of what was happening with the Black students at Caltech in the last couple of years, mm-hmm. we had a similar fight with Nesby back 91, 92. We spent many, many days in Thomas Everhart's office trying to plead with him that Martin Luther King's birthday was a federal holiday, but it was not a holiday observed at Caltech. Everhart had made it very clear that as far as he was concerned, Caltech was a very unique place, that it only took certain days as holidays, but it did not observe all of the federal days fellow holidays as institute holidays. I know we had argued maybe to move one of the other institute holidays to Martin Luther King's Day, but Everhart said no. He was not going to do it. He was steadfast in this and would not budge. His philosophy was if individual professors wanted to make their own decisions to cancel classes in observation of this day, he would have no issue with it but he wasn't going to declare universally that that day was a holiday. Now, this was the catch 22 that we were going with. So yes, we met with Thomas Everhart. We wrote many, many letters to him. He completely ignored us. I mean, why should he ignore us? He met with us, but he would just smile and say, thank you for coming. It's not gonna happen. We did spend some time in a campaign to try to convince the undergrads and the faculty members, council class, or don't go to class. Humanities and social sciences backed us up 100%. They canceled classes. They decided as a department, they were not gonna have classes at all. In fact, they went one step further. Every year they would bring in an outside speaker to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. So, you know, so we love the support that we got from HNSS. So of course we tried to convince the undergrads on campus HNSS has this Martin Luther King speaker. We're going to support it as the Black Student Unions. We're asking you to go as well. The universal response we got was, I can't go to it because I have classes. And see, that was our catch-22. We tried to convince students to go to this thing because it's a good thing to do. We think that the students thought it was a good thing, but they couldn't go because their professors weren't going to cancel classes. So we, we were stuck. You know, every year we would have the celebration, we would have this outside speaker, we'd have 100% support from HNSS, we would advertise it on campus. And every year we could barely get any students to go because the students who were taking classes in physics, math, biology, you name it, they had to go to classes those days and they wouldn't go to the events. So we, we would get maybe 10 students to attend these whereas we probably would get like another 15 people from the local Pasadena community that would come to it. Um, I assume that it's the same activity happening now. I think that it's a much bigger event on campus. But I just remember being frustrated at this event every single year because we could never get Everhart to pay attention to us. Now, I remember talking to Doug Fleming every single year about this, just wondering why is it that Everhart was not willing to listen to us about this? And we could never come up with a good answer. Andre, did the social and political context affect your academics in terms of the kinds of courses that you poured your effort into, where your interests were, or did you try to keep those worlds separate? I think everyone knew that I had at least a dual life, Um, the life of a scientist and the life of, well, someone who was in, I guess I should say, I don't want to use these words, but I'll say a student activist. Um, 
those are words I definitely would not have used when, when I was an undergraduate. But, you know, I, I was a math physics double major. And as math physics double majors go, you have to take a lot of really difficult classes. So I was taking five, six classes every quarter. I was at Caltech, you know, constantly in the math department, taking grad level courses. And I had friends who were grad students who were in the same classes I was taking. And they could see I was still the top student in the class. You know, again, I mentioned uh, this AMA 95 class. That essentially is a grad level course. There are a good number of students, graduate students taking that course. I then took the corresponding classes after that. I don't remember the numbers, maybe AMA 101 or 105, something like this. Those were almost entirely grad level courses. But I was still getting the top grades in those grad level courses. Same thing when it came to the mathematics courses, taking group theory in classes that were meant for first and second year grad students, but still getting the top grades in those classes. Um, so I mean, the students knew, the other undergrads there on campus knew I was doing really, really well. But they also knew that I was very much involved with the NESPE chapter, essentially the Black Student Union chapter. And I was making a big stink about things like um, having information about the old Negro leagues on my door and trying to really push hard that Martin Luther King's Day should be an institute holiday. And also really putting out there what was happening with the black students on campus and how people are getting harassed by campus security. So, you know, so these are things that I was actively talking about whenever students would, would meet with me. And I think on the one hand, I was respected because of the academics, because of how well I was doing. But on the other hand, I was somewhat despised because I was bringing up all these issues that people just didn't want to talk about, and that they didn't want to hear about. And we're not just saying from the white students, we're also saying from the minority students as well. There were a good number of minority students that did not want to hear about Martin Luther King's Day being an institute holiday or what was happening with the other black students on campus and why students were failing out. Um, so it, it, was, it was a very difficult time because I had to, I decided to wear both hats. I was a mathematician and a physicist, but I was also someone running the, the Nesby chapter. And it, it was hard finding ways to balance the two because one was respected by the students, but the other one was not. Edre, what classes or professors offered you options in mathematical physics to the extent that that bridged the, the, the divide? There really wasn't any 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 bridge to that divide. I mean, the, the divide was there and it never got any easier. Um, you know, I guess that, that I've read all these things that Richard Feynman notoriously really did not like the mathematics department. And unfortunately, you could tell the math department didn't like the physics department in return. Math and physics, even though they were in buildings right next to each other, they never spoke with each other. There was never any interaction. The closest that it got, of course, is this guy named Barry Simon, who's there in the math department, but no one else in the math department interacted with anyone in physics. It was just very clear, separate worlds, separate departments, and they were never going to interact with each other. The physics department was very much an old school classical department that said, you learn theoretical physics in the classroom, but then you learn experimentation in the lab and you must do both. So there wasn't any of this, you can sit in a classroom, do a whole bunch of math problems, and that's how you understand physics. You had to do both. I believe that as physics majors, we had to take labs freshman year, junior year, and senior year, all three years. Now, I love the labs. I'm, I'm glad that I did the labs. But I ultimately decided not to do physics because Caltech drained in me, droned in me this idea that you have to be able to do both. You have to be able to be in the lab and also do the theoretical part. I never saw physics at Caltech as something where you could just do math and be a good physicist. It was more the philosophy of if you just do math, you're a mathematician, which of course is ultimately why, why I decided to do math. But I, I will definitely say there wasn't mathematical physics at Caltech. There, was, there were physicists who could do math, but at the end of the day, they were physicists. And for you, do you have a clear memory of when it was going to be math that you wanted to 
focus on for graduate school? I have a clear memory at Caltech of what pretty much pushed me over the edge. It, it wasn't until my second year of grad school that I really made the firm commitment that I was going to go into math. But there was an incident that happened my senior year that, that pretty much told me, yeah, you're going into math. Um, you know, senior year, we had our physics courses, but we also had our lab courses. And I really struggled with senior lab. Part of this was I was just very involved with the Nesby chapter. Remember that Eddie Grotto had been fired. There was this new guy, Frank Vargas, who had come from the admissions office, and he was running the minority student affairs office. But the reality was he wasn't running it. I was still running it full time. Um, you know, he wasn't there for any of the events on the weekends or in the evenings because he kept saying he had a new baby and he wanted to be involved with that. But the point is that he wasn't involved and the students knew it. The students despised him for it. So I pretty much ran that office my entire senior year. But I was also trying to graduate with degrees in math and physics, which meant I was still taking these grad level courses in math and I still had to worry about finishing off the senior lab in physics. I was paired with an unfortunate person who was really good at the labs and she decided she was gonna do all the labs by herself, which meant after about maybe the third, fourth week of the, of the quarter, I did not have lab partner. So I had to figure out how to do the rest of the semester by myself. Um, the guy who ran the labs really felt sorry for me. You know, this is one of these grad students in physics because he could see me there in the lab every week struggling by myself to kind of get all this together because my lab partner, she came in at these ungodly hours to get the labs done and she never told me. If I had known, I would have found a new partner, but, but I didn't know. So I spent really the rest of the semester trying to struggle with these labs, get everything done. Whenever there was a mistake, I had to redo the experiments. And of course, it was just crazy trying to find time to be in the lab for all of these extra hours and then run this office and worry about Nesby and worry about math classes and so on and so forth. But I put in my hours down in the lab and I eventually got it done. There was one day, one of the older white physics professors came in. There weren't many people in the lab at this point because it was getting close to the end of the day. But the, the grad student TA was there. I was there, maybe one or two undergrads. And he looks at me working by myself and he's seeing that I'm kind of like struggling just to kind of get certain things together to get this experiment done. And he looks at me and says, you are a very poor physicist. And just based on how badly you're doing here in this lab, I should fail you in this lab just to make sure you don't get a physics degree. And walks out the lab. The grad student TA hears this and comes over and says, I am so sorry, I can't believe that he just said that. But I just decided just to brush it off. You know, of course I wasn't happy with it, but I had to finish the lab. So I must've worked for maybe another hour, another half an hour. And I had to pack up and I went over to my notice student an affairs so I can kind of do my next thing, you know, trying to figure out, sending off emails to the students and, and all the rest of that. But it was that one interaction. Here it is, last quarter at Caltech, senior year, that this guy is going to tell me that he thinks that I'm a poor physicist. That's what pushed me over the edge. That's what made me decide I'm not going to do physics. And I didn't think about it after that semester ended. I don't think I've really set foot in the physics building since then. You know, once or twice just to see Steve Frouchy, but yeah, not really since. Edre, this is a few years before the dot-com boom really gets started, but was there a startup culture among undergraduates at Caltech? Were people going into, I mean, specifically the, 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 the mathematics and physics majors, were they going mm -hmm. to Silicon Valley? Were they talking about being quants on Wall Street? Did you think about not going that route of graduate school and pursuing something in technology or finance? So th this is way, way before the dot-com days. This was, let's say, 93, because I graduated in 94. Um, I, you know, I went to grad school in the Bay Area, and that's when the dot-com started. So right. I saw Apple blowing up. Like, I remember the day that Red Hat Linux went um, went with this, it's, um, went public. So I remember all of that happening quite vividly when I lived there in Palo Alto. But 93, 94, all of that was too far off in the future. I, I remember particularly one guy, he was one of the two black students majoring in physics, um, Stanley Grant. 
So he decided when he graduated, he was not going to go to grad school. And, you know, remember, like he counted, this is what everybody did. Everybody decided that they were going to go to grad school. The people who decided not to go to grad school because they were going to work full time, people looked down on them because we thought, you know, well, what's the point? You're at this big research institution. The point is to go off, do research, become a great scientist, win a Nobel Prize, so on and so forth. So this guy said, no, he wasn't going to go to grad school. He kind of had enough. He was going to go work full time. So we asked him, where are you going to work? He said, this small company in Seattle called Microsoft. So we thought, okay, fine. You know, if you want to work at this place that works on word processing software, <laughs> knock yourself out. So we kind of felt sorry for him because we thought, you know, he's going to be a loser and do all of this. As the story goes, when he got there, they convinced him, take so much of the percentage of your salary and put it in stocks. Don't just take the money up front. He did this when he graduated in 94. I believe they said that he was a millionaire first time over, maybe five years after that. But I just remember like around the year 2000 or so, kind of asking people how Stanley was doing. And they all said that, yeah, you know, he had this big, beautiful house in Seattle. He was doing incredibly well. But I just remember that it kind of shocked a lot of us because, you know, again, we thought he was kind of like the loser, that he, he just was going to work for this company that wasn't going to be much. But we had no idea the dot-coms were going to blow up like that just a few years after graduation. Yeah. But yeah, nobody did that. Nobody went off to Silicon Valley because it really didn't exist. No one went off to hedge funds because, again, that was looked down upon. What everybody aspired to do was to go off, get a PhD, and worry about winning the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anyone that I talked to who even wanted to like go work for, say, like Boeing, Lockheed. No one wanted to do that. It was all about going off to grad school, getting your PhD. Of course, it's different now. It's, it's a very different world nowadays. But 93, that was not the case. Absolutely no one talked about that. Besides Steve Frouchy's formative advice, what other programs did you consider? Well, my story about grad school is, is this. Um, senior year... I knew I wanted to either go to grad school in math or physics. I was leaning a lot more towards math, but very specifically, I wanted to work in number theory. I had gotten really obsessed with this idea of group theory and the other ideas in number theory. So I went online to try to see who are some of the more interesting number theorists in the country. I don't really know why, but I got obsessed with this guy named Richard Taylor. Um, I can't even say that I met him. I have no idea how I learned about him, but I may have just gone online, saw his name at Harvard University, got really interested in some of the stuff that is said on his website. So I had a plan that went as follows. My number one choice for grad school was to go to Harvard so that I could do mathematics PhD with Richard Taylor. If that didn't work, my number two plan would be to go to MIT because it was right down the street from Harvard where I could still work to be Richard Taylor to get my PhD. If that didn't work, then I could stay in California, I could go to Stanford, possibly transfer to Berkeley if I needed to, but Steve said he really liked Stanford, so Stanford was gonna be my number three. And because those were the three top schools in the country in math, maybe that was a little bit arrogant for me to apply to, so I was gonna to apply to UC Santa Cruz as my backup. If things didn't work at Santa Cruz, at least I would be in California, I could just decide to apply to grad school all over again the next year. I had seen Alan Knudsen do something similar to this the year before. He had just graduated as a senior in math in 93. He's someone that would come to my dorm room like once a week just to kind of check up on me and kind of encourage me to go into math. But the rumor was he had applied to grad school, asked for a letter of recommendation from some of the faculty. They didn't write him a good letter and he didn't get it anywhere for grad school. So he went to UC Santa Cruz for a year, found a new set of letter writers, eventually got into MIT for grad school, which is where he went, and now he's had a great stellar career. You know, he's a professor at Cornell University these days. So I thought kind of the same thing. If everything went to hell, it didn't work, at least I can go to Santa Cruz for a year, I could reapply, and then I'd be just fine. So for grad school, I only applied to four places, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and Santa Cruz. And I know that's completely insane, but, you know, but I was pretty cocky as, as an undergrad. I was convinced I was going to get into at least one of those, so not, not worried at all. When I applied, 
somewhere halfway through the application season, it just turned out that there was a professor, a math professor from Santa Cruz, who was maybe giving a talk in the math department. So he reached out to me and said that he was going to be kind of recruiting students on campus and he wanted to sit down and meet with me. So I met with him and came in the room and I was a little bit surprised because I didn't realize that he had read my application and knew it well. And he said right away, you are a really good student. We know that you've applied to Santa Cruz. You're probably going to get in, but we also know that you're going to go to other places. So good luck to you in your career because we know that you're not going to go to Santa Cruz. You know, it was kind of like his, his funny way of saying, you're really good. You're too good to come to Santa Cruz. So, you know, see you later. That was somewhat of a validating kind of conversation. You know, remember, I didn't really get a lot of support. Well, I really got no support from the math department. So seeing this professor from this totally different campus, he just read my application, that he thought that I was good. That, that really did mean a lot. But the three schools I really wanted to go to, Harvard, MIT, and Stanford. I got into Stanford from, and I felt somewhat bad that it was my third choice of all these places. You know, again, remember, I was kind of a cocky undergrad. I remember going to, I guess like this admissions weekend is where they really had invited all of the minority students from all of the departments at Stanford to come at once. This is kind of the way Stanford did things back in the day. They actually coordinated over all the different departments that all the minority students would come in and they'd all get to know each other. So yes, I got to, to, to interact with some of the newly admitted students in the math department, but I also met minority students in, you know, like engineering and humanities and, and all these, these other areas. So when I was there at Stanford, I ran into this guy who was in his first year, but he was a Caltech alum. He had just graduated maybe the year before. I didn't remember him, but he said he remembered me. So I met with him and he tells me he's leaving Stanford because he's going to transfer to some other, some other school. So I asked him why, and he says, coming from Caltech, Stanford is too easy. So here I am at this visitation weekend, already a little bit depressed that Stanford is my third choice, seeing this guy leaving Stanford after his first year, telling me Stanford's kind of a joke. And, and I'm kind of wondering now, Am I going to be okay for, for grad school? Like, that was kind of where things left off at the end of my senior year. Um, I will say, though, it all has a happy ending. Stanford, for me, was the best decision I could have ever made. I was certainly happier there five years at Stanford than I ever was at, at Caltech. Um, but certainly, I did have like you know these weird kind of interactions when it came to, to applying to grad schools. Obviously, as a graduate student, you can't claim the kind of naivete you had as a high school senior thinking about Caltech's diversity or lack thereof. How right. much homework did you do in thinking about graduate programs where you might have said to yourself, I want an easier experience on that level for graduate school than I had at Caltech? I had probably thought more about what I wanted my graduate experience to be than I think any grad student I've met to this day. Um, one of the nice things about Caltech is you are taking classes with other grad students as early as your sophomore year. You know, being a part of Nesby meant that literally half the people I knew were grad students. So starting sophomore year, I understood what it meant to take qualifying exams and worry about language exams. And this whole thing of like being all but dissertation and finding an advisor. I had heard about this for three solid years before I went to grad school. I had seen some students come in and struggle with things like trying to get TA ships and apply for these outside fellowships. I knew about the NSF fellowships that were out there. I also saw some people getting kicked out of grad school because they did not do well on their exams. I saw some people have really good relationships with their PhD advisors. Others have really bad relationships with their PhD advisors. So I saw all of this firsthand. You know, some of these were friends that I had because I was taking classes with them. Others were students that I could see through the Nesby chapter. You know, us having conversations saying such and such a person just failed their qualifying exam. They're probably going to get kicked out of school and we need to figure out what to do. So I saw all of this sophomore, junior, senior years, which meant I thought really hard 
about the kind of graduate experience I wanted to construct. But I do use that word very precisely. I wanted to construct the experience. So I thought about going to the department that wasn't too large. You know, if you take a look at Stanford and Harvard, they're about similar sized departments. We're talking roughly, let's say maybe 20 or so faculty, another 100 or so graduate students. I wanted a department that was only gonna bring in about 15 grad students a year because I wanted a department small enough where I would really not feel like I'm just part of this machine. That was the reason why I did not apply to Berkeley. I did not wanna go to a larger department. I also was very sure in the area that I wanted to work in so much as the advisor I wanted to work with. I knew the number theory faculty at Harvard. I knew the number theory faculty at MIT. I also knew the number theory faculty at Stanford, which meant when I got to Stanford day one, I was gonna work with one or two people. I knew that right away. So I met one of the two people I was gonna work with, realized pretty quickly we were not gonna get along. So then I went to the second person. Now the second person, I'm probably scared him a little bit because I told him in the very first day that I met him, I wanted him to be my advisor. And I specifically wanted to work on, on how elliptic curves form ternary group algebras. And, you know, you typically don't do that. When you find a new advisor, you kind of come in and say, I'm interested in working with you. Let's maybe chat a little bit, do a reading course, work on things. Now I told this guy right away first day, here's what I'm going to do for my dissertation. Because again, I had really thought about this very carefully. I also knew I did not want to have a social life in the math department. I did not like the social atmosphere at Caltech and I did not want the same for grad school. So within the first month or so when I got to Stanford, I asked the question to as many people as I could, who are the movers and shakers in the black community? And within a month, I found out who they were. And by black community, <laughs> do you mean campus or Palo Alto more generally? Campus, uh -huh. yeah, in, in, the camp, in the black campus community, the black community on campus. So I learned about this thing called the Black Graduate Students Association. I learned who the officers were. I learned about the activities that they had, and I latched onto that organization right away. I pretty much became an officer by my second year there at Stanford. Um, you know, so I'm saying like, like all of these things, I knew exactly the kind of experience that I wanted to have. I knew the kind of advisor that I wanted. I knew that I wanted to have an advisor that was more hands-off, that I wanted to work at my own pace, and I would come in once a week tell him what I was working on. I knew that I wanted to be in a place where there already was a strong, vibrant Black community where I could come in and just kind of be a part of it and not have to worry so much about building it myself from scratch. Um, I wanted to be in a dorm that was going to focus on multiculturalism. And, you know, so I was very careful to look online to see which schools had these things. So when I came to Stanford day one, I knew exactly what I wanted my life to be. Um, which is why it's ironic because you might think that the math department at Stanford was a hostile place. And, and in some ways it was. When I got there, there had only been two black students before me who had successfully graduated with a PhD in the whole history of Stanford. So I was going to be number three. Um, there were no other black students in the department, no other black faculty. In fact, in all of STEM, I believe there were only two black faculty, one guy in physics and one guy in, in geosciences. No black faculty, even in biology, chemistry. Um, so it wasn't, I'll say, a more diverse place than Caltech. It was probably about the same. But I wanted to leave all of that that I saw at Caltech behind me. I really embedded myself in the black community at, at Stanford. But that's because that was part of my conscious decision of what my grad school would be like. And it was more organized. There was something for you to join rather than something that you needed to create. That is correct. That is definitely right. Did you ever look into the origins or the history of that community, how it got started, how far back it goes at Stanford? I I never did, but I know that it's it was, had a very long history. It must have started back in the 1950s, 1940s or so. Um, I think the thing is Stanford really has had such a, a great long history that I never worried about it much in the same way that, that I did at, at Caltech. Um, it, it was more that you could really just focus on being a black student at Stanford 
and not worry about anything else. And you have such a history and a community and a culture there that it, it didn't really matter. You know, um, I was in the graduate residences where I was a um, an RA for the Multicultural Fame House. So this is one of the houses that apparently was started by some of the Black graduate students maybe 10 years before I got there. There were various demands that they had on campus about just having a place for the Black students to live and kind of like celebrate their own cultures and what have you. I had tried to do the same thing at Caltech some years before, and the whole thing failed spectacularly. But Stanford had this, and it had existed, and it had a budget, and it had a complete buy-in from the campus. So I was just amazed that I could come in, and now I was the RA for this thing. I had my own staff, I had my own budget, and there were activities that we could put on. One of the people who worked in the housing office was a Black alum this guy who had graduated back in the 1970s or so. So the fact that he was there as part of my housing staff, I could constantly go to him and just kind of ask about like the way things were back 20, 30 years before. He could definitely tell his stories about when he was an undergraduate. What's actually even crazier is his son was an undergraduate there at Stanford at the time. And his son actually was a pretty well-known rapper with this group that was my favorite group at the time. I had no idea that his son was, was a student there. I had no idea that his son was actually like the lead rapper as part of this group. So it was almost like the opposite of Caltech. You know, me wanting to play my rap music, nobody even wanting to listen to it. And out here at Stanford, the guy who's the lead of this group is a student there at the school. So it, it, was, it was like heaven for me, you know. But again, like there was this whole black excellence culture that was there that had been there for decades. It was just a very, very different place. Edry, to go back to the specificity on day one with your research agenda, to what extent was that about the fact that you had taken courses at the graduate level at Caltech and you had excelled in those courses? It, it was very much about that. You know, it wasn't just the courses that I was taking. I was very interested. I just read a lot of books on my own. You know, I was constantly at the library. I was constantly just reading more and more. And I had a pretty good idea of what I was interested in. You know, I did want to go to grad school because I wanted to prove some big, big theorem. I wasn't just there just to say, I just want to get another degree so I can kind of keep moving. You know, I, but I saw it as this is one step towards a larger plan that I had in mind. So this project that I worked on, pretty much I started working on my sophomore year. At Caltech. Now, yes, I learned some of these concepts in grad level courses, but as I started to read more and more on my own, I wanted to really turn this into a full fledged project and eventually a full fledged career. So, this is why I completely knew the scope of the project and what I wanted to do. That's why I could walk into Dan Bum's office day one saying I wanted to combine all of these together because I wanted to continue doing what I had been doing for the last three years or so. You know, I just didn't quite realize that you don't really do that, but, but you know, that was still what happened. Edre, I wonder again for our non-mathematician audience, if you could translate that initial interest and then explain why it was this topic that you wanted to pursue in graduate school. So as an undergraduate, at first I was exposed to the concept of calculus. You know, of course I saw calculus in, in high school, but you see it in a very different way when you're at Caltech. You know, you see calculus in the sense of differential equations and how things come about in physics and chemistry and all these other areas. Everything all kind of blends in together. Um, you see calculus and try and explain how the world works around you, how things move. You also use calculus when it comes to things like quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, and even the periodic table. But that's stuff that I saw in my freshman year. I could completely understand calculus, differential equations, it was all very powerful in bringing all of these subjects together. What I didn't understand is where calculus had its play in mathematics. Math took a very different direction for me starting freshman year. I saw this book in number theory, so I realized that there was something that wasn't calculus, but I didn't really know what it was. By sophomore year, I was taking a class in abstract algebra, which is almost like the way it sounds. You take algebra, but now you're kind of abstracting different concepts. 
I didn't realize that this is something you could do. I just thought, you know, if you say are told solve for X, you just do all of this arithmetic, you know, divide, multiply, and what have you. I didn't understand that you can actually question what's the concept of addition? What is the concept of multiplication? What does it mean to solve for X if X isn't a number? What if X is a matrix or what if it's a function? These are things that just completely blew my mind and they cause me to think about mathematics in a totally different way. So as I took abstract algebra, I became obsessed. I took three, four different courses and this idea of group theory when I was there at Caltech. And one of the things that happens in these classes is you're taught to think in a very abstract way, but you're really taught to question a lot of the assumptions that you originally had. Things like if you solve for X, asking the question, does X really need to be a number? Or when you try to do things like multiply things together, asking the question, what's multiplication exactly? That's where I became really obsessed, was even questioning what abstract algebra was showing me, wanting to abstract what I was learning in abstract algebra. That was the whole idea for grad school, was taking a lot of those questions that I had and going one step further. It really became an obsession because I had never thought about this before. I'd never thought in high school, you can question these concepts of what does it mean to solve for X? I just got so used to almost like the, the cookbook approach from calculus of here's a problem in physics or in chemistry that you want to solve. All that you have to do is just write it as a calculus problem. You run through the recipes of you solve the calculus problem. Then that gives you back an explanation of what you see in physics or chemistry. I just thought that's the way the world worked. I did not know that you can abstract all of these concepts. So that became my graduate school experience, really just abstracting all of algebra. Andre, if you can explain the coursework components to graduate school, the individual study in graduate school, and the one-on-one -on -one time with your graduate advisor in mm -hmm. mathematics. Um, I was in grad school for five years. Um, the very first year, you take general classes with most of your first-year classmates. There were around 15 of us, I believe, that came in my first year. This is in 1994. And we all took, I would say, three classes together, um, real analysis, complex analysis, and algebra. I was considered to be kind of like the resident algebraist because I just knew algebra so well coming from, from Caltech. Um, I also knew complex analysis really well because of AMA 95. I can't say that I knew real analysis really well, but we all took these classes all together, you know, all kind of going to the same lecture together, all kind of working on the same homework assignments together. But that was the very first year. You're all taking the same three classes or so, all for the first year. The summer between the first and second year, you take a series of qualifying exams. For us at the time, these were written exams. Each one was, I believe, maybe three hours or so, and you have to take them. At Stanford, it was, they were actually very harsh. You have only two chances, two tries at the exam, but you must pass all three before you start your second year. Most of us passed all three of them. The ones who don't are allowed to stay for one more semester at the time, one more quarter, and then you have to go elsewhere. I wanna say of the 15 of us, all but maybe four of us made it through through to the second year. Now, the second year is very different um, because you aren't really taking classes together. You know, kind of the idea of the first year, you're all in a class together, so you can all take the exams in these three areas, real analysis, complex analysis, and algebra. But then at the end of that summer, now you're kind of on your own to do whatever you want. I tried to take a couple of classes with some of my other friends, but of course, they're starting to move in different areas, different directions research-wise. I remember taking this one class in the area called um, algebraic topology, realizing that when we got our very first homework assignment, I realized I didn't want to do homework anymore. So I dropped the class. That's the last homework assignment I've ever been assigned. <laughs> I just decided I just did not want to do any more homework at, at all. So I had friends who were taking this class, but I wasn't taking any classes with them. 
Instead, I decided to work with this guy in a one-on-one -on -one reading course just so that I could get to know him a little bit better. This is when, start of my second year, I introduced myself to Dan Bump, who would eventually be my advisor. This is where I walked in pretty much the first day of, this, of the quarter saying, I wanted to work with you. Eventually, you know, I'm thinking about doing this as my dissertation. But he said, well, why don't we think about doing a reading course first to get to know each other? What that meant for him was there was a book he wanted me to read. And he would just say, just read a chapter or so and then come back once a week. We'll sit here at the chalkboard and we'll talk about it. What I didn't know at the time was he had done this with all of his students. He would give this book, which is notoriously a very difficult to read book. I didn't know this because his other students were pretty far advanced. They were already in their fourth and fifth years. I was only one in my second year. So in a sense, I was kind of working by myself. After about maybe two months of me kind of reading through this, I just had to be honest with them and say, I didn't really like the book. I was kind of struggling to understand it but I wanted to work with another book. What I learned is all of his other students balked within the first week and told him that they hated the book, they didn't want to read it anymore, and he assigned them a different book. I was the only one that actually stuck with it for almost two months. So I think that that, that meant something to him that he did kind of give me this test and, and somewhat I passed it. Um, he then gave me a second book to read through, which he saw it as kind of an introduction and what he wanted me to do for my thesis. It was more like an algorithms book. It, it had a list of these different commands that you could write in for a computer that would explain how to compute certain things with elliptic curves, module forms, some of these other funny things. I really liked this book because I was really good at using Mathematica, you know, something I learned at Caltech and I just figured everybody knew Mathematica. I didn't know that but I just was really good at it. So he just said, here, read this book. I would go back home. I would just code up various parts of this book just for the fun of it. Um, eventually he wanted me, he made it clear, he wanted me to really write a serious series of computer programs that implemented what was in the book. I worked on that for maybe another three months and I told him, so at this point we had worked together for almost half a year, wasn't interested, didn't really want to do it. That turned out to be fortuitous because about three months after that conversation, Dan happened to be invited to go to Berkeley to give a talk. And I met this guy who was a grad student who said he had been working on implementing that same book for the last two years. And he was nearly done with all of the implementation. So if I had started working on this book like the way Dan had won it, it would have been a complete waste because this other guy had been working on it much longer and had gotten a lot farther. So actually this guy and I turned out, we actually became fast friends because as I completely understood what he was trying to implement because I had tried to do the same thing. So this meant that Dan had to find a second project to work on. Um, now, you know, we're still kind of meeting once a week. We're just kind of chatting about things here, there. You know, he's still saying, read this book, learn this concept. So I'm still learning from him. It's not a formal class. But, you know, we are sitting there one-on-one -on -one in our chairs chatting about what's in these books. Somewhere at the start of my third year, Dan says, I have this one student that's now finishing. She did the following in her thesis, but she didn't really finish it. I would love for you to finish this and make it much stronger. I read her thesis, didn't really understand what he wanted me to do. And we spent probably the next three months, me constantly asking him the question, what do you want me to do? Why do you think this is possible? What inspired me was when he finally said, I have no idea if this is possible, but I want you to try it anyway. When he said he didn't know, that lit a green light. Mm -hmm. And I was completely inspired to keep working. So my third year, I decided to go off on my own. I kind of told Dan what I wanted out of our relationship was for me to come in once a week and I would just give him a report. I would go to the chalkboard explaining to him what I'm doing, what I'm working on, but I wanted to spend the rest of the time on my own working on things. Dan said, in return, what I want to do is 
spend time at the chalkboard giving you many lectures on these other areas that maybe you should know. Dan was trained in representation theory. I wanted to work in elliptic curves. So kind of our compromise was this is what we were going to do every week. So for about two years, this is what we did. We would come in Wednesday afternoons. I would spend half an hour. I go to the chalkboard. I would say, here's what I learned from reading this thesis. Here are some papers that I read in the field. Here's how I think I can generalize this. Here's the direction I'm going to go in. Here's my outline. Then for the next hour, hour and a half, Dan will pull out his yellow notepad with his black felt pen, and he would say, here's things that you should know about representation theory. And we had this one-on-one -on -one back and forth for two years, and it, it worked beautifully. You know, whenever I could explain things to him, he could explain things to me. Where everything culminated was in the start of my fourth year, when I walked in to Dan's office, remember, after being at Caltech, I knew I wanted to finish in four years. That was the plan. Not five years, finish in four years. And I kept telling Dan this, I want to finish in four years. I don't think Dan believed me when I told him this, but I kept telling him this. Starting my fourth year, I walk in and I tell Dan, um, I solved the dissertation problem. Dan's like, you know, I, I don't believe you. I Because, you know, because at that point, I just kind of tell him, here's all the outlines. I said, okay, came in the next week plopped on his desk an 80-page dissertation. So remember, with my days as an undergraduate, I saw grad students struggling to try to like solve the dissertation, struggling to write the dissertation. They would spend like the last two months trying to write all of this. I told myself, no, I'm going to write it every week over the four years. I am not going to write it at the very end. I saw too many people stress out. So I spent about two and a half years writing the thesis. I did not wait till the end, but I didn't tell Dan I was spending two and a half years. So when he questioned whether I was done, I plopped this 80 page thesis on his desk. His eyes went wide. He's like, I, I didn't even know that you were working on this. Why, why did you keep that from him? I didn't really see any reason to tell him. I just assumed if I'm working on a thesis, I'm working on a thesis. You know, I didn't know until I talked to other students in the department. That wasn't the way they did it. They all waited to the last minute. But I, I worked on it each and every week. So all the conversations he and I have been having this whole time, I was writing up each and every one of those. So I had like this beautiful manuscript that had everything written up in, in detail. This other thesis that he had me reading through, I reworked all the formulas. I understood every last detail of what she did. That was a chapter in the thesis. Like, you know, kind of rewriting Annette Clutus thesis. So I had worked out all of the stuff, but I never bothered to tell Dan, probably because I was too focused on saying, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to finish things. So when Dan saw the thesis, that's when he realized that I really had solved the problem he gave me. You know, I didn't really kind of put everything in one place, but when he saw it all there in one place, he realized that, yeah, it was done. It was completely solved. So Dan, this is when he kind of churned a little bit and said, this is great. I'm kind of in shock that, you know, that the, the thesis is written, everything's done. However, what if you can prove the slightly stronger result? So just like the two years before, I asked him, well, why do you think this is true? He said, I have no idea why this is true, but it would be really great if you can prove this. So I was inspired. I went back and I worked for the next year and a half on trying to prove this this larger result. Obviously, you felt it was in your interest to spend this extra time. It was. I, I wasn't happy with the idea of spending a fifth year, but I spent all of that fourth year working on the new result. And then at the start of the fifth year, I got it. What do you think Dan's motivation was? Did he see that you could achieve something that wasn't just good and early, but great? I think so. I, I do think so. Um, you know, the, the other students that he had up to that point, they were good students, but it was definitely clear that they were only going to go so far, you know, that they kind of like had figured out their thesis and then they were ready to move on, have a full-time job, this kind of thing. I think with Dan, he could really see this hunger of, he had given me this problem, the very first one, kind of the easy one, I solved it. So then he said, I'm going to go for broke. Let me give him the big, big one. When he told me the big problem, the one he really wanted to do, I could actually see that was a significant problem. What was it? But can I can also can see you, how to solve it. 
Can you explain it, this significant problem? I, I, I can. Um, when Dan himself was in grad school, he had this really good friend who was a grad student at Harvard. So he knew about this guy's thesis from Harvard for years and years. But the guy at Harvard had done, there was an outstanding conjecture in the field. It's known as Arden's conjecture for icosahedral Gawa representations. No one knew if that conjecture was true back in the 70s. But this guy wrote a computer program. Yes, in the 1970s, he wrote a computer program that figured out how to come up with one example to show that the conjecture was true in this one specific case. In the decade or so after that, other people figured out how to make their computers run a little bit faster so that instead of having the one example that Joe Bueller had, they had maybe another eight examples. But this was going from maybe 1975 up through about 1995, there were max 10 examples in the literature of this conjecture. Dan had this idea of instead of going through this computer program, writing this nasty algorithm that Joe Bueller's and others had done, can you explain his example using a completely different method? Because the idea, if you could write a completely different method, you could potentially come up with infinitely many examples to show that the conjecture was true. What Dan didn't tell me was, he first needed to know from Annette Clouse's thesis how to even generate one example using this weird stuff that this German mathematician wrote back in the 1880s or so. Once I figured out the German from the 1880s and what Annette had done and how to come up with the one example, that was what I had showed Dan at the start of my fourth year. I could explain this one example and the formulas were beautiful enough that I could write down as many examples as I wanted to and I could do it very easily. So this is when Dan said, if you can do it with this one example, can you actually go one step further and figure out how to redo Joe Bueller's thesis? So the start of my fourth year is when I even heard any of this. I had no idea that this, this was, was the plan all along. So simply put, in my fourth year, I figured out how to come up with an elliptic curve that should be associated with Joe's thesis. So what I had to do was prove that this elliptic curve was modular. That, that's the, the parlance. That's what Dan did not know how to do. So I had to rack my brain for a year to learn a completely different field, totally different direction to figure out how to do this. It turned out it was actually a good thing because right about that time, if you remember back, the guy I wanted to work with originally for my thesis, Richard Taylor, he actually was working on exactly the same problem. So it was kind of this weird twist of faith that in my last year, I started to kind of look through the literature to see what are some ways to do this, and Richard Taylor's name comes up. And I realized that he's working on exactly the same problem. Given an elliptic curve, how do you prove that it's associated to weight one modular form? And an even more bizarre twist of fate, in my last year, Richard actually comes to Stanford so he can give a talk on the research that he's been doing. Because he's kind of blown up the math world at this point by proving some really great results, coming up with some really clever ideas. So I'm basically in the library every week, like kind of reading the papers of what he's doing and, and all the rest of this. Um, you know, it goes back to my undergraduate days. I'm always at the library reading things. So Richard Taylor comes to Stanford. And remember that there's only one number theorist at Stanford, namely Dan Baum. The three of us are now in his office, myself, Richard Taylor, and Dan. And, you know, like, so Dan, because I'm his grad student, I'm really the only one at the time, the other ones had graduated, he introduces me to Richard. And I turn to Richard and say, I've been reading this paper of yours that just came out on how to prove modularity of these elliptic curves of weight one modular forms. Dan is completely shocked because he doesn't know about this paper. He's trying to figure out how do I know about this paper. And I know the paper well enough that now Richard and I can like go to the chalkboard and actually talk about the details of what's happening here. So I'm telling Richard about kind of what I've been trying to do for my thesis and how I'm very interested in what he's been doing the last couple of years. Richard and I totally hit it off. And Richard invites me to basically come visit and work with him at Harvard for the next year. It just completely worked out that, you know, all, all in just this incredibly fortuitous way. I think Dan was completely shocked that I had really taken the initiative with all of this. Because again, he didn't work in this area. He had no intuition how to solve this problem. I had done all the work on my own to go to the library, look up all these papers, read up all these things, learn everything on my own. So it 
it was it was a good time. It, it was kind of a strange time that this all worked out the way that it did. But Dan and I had some really, really good, fun conversations like that. You know, I definitely shocked him more than once. He, he definitely told me that, that I was, you know, one of the, the, the most enterprising grad students that, that he ever had. But it, it was it was a fun time back then. Andre, of course, being at Stanford in, with the tech boom in full swing, did you ever think about jumping in, not not continuing on the academic route? No, never did. Um, I had a lot of friends who did. A lot of friends in, in other departments that, you know, they were really wondering, why are they struggling as a grad student making no money when quite literally 10 minutes down the street, you have people, undergrads, who are finishing from Stanford who have their own startups who are making millions and millions of dollars. So there were a lot of grad students that I had at Friends who seriously thought about dropping out of grad school so that they could go work for, for one of these startups. It, it, was, it was a really bizarre set of days my last few years at Stanford. Like, I, I can't even explain what it's like to live in the middle of something where the undergrads that you are TAing for are graduating, working for a startup, and you know for a fact that they made their first million within six months of graduation. And this was happening all the time, right and left. It, it was just a very, very strange set of days there at, at Stanford. Um, I always wanted to be a college professor. Mm -hmm. And very specifically, I wanted to be a professor that was going to make my mark on the field of research. I, I just never felt making money like that, working for a tech firm, was something that was going to make me happy. The timing after you defended was the first stop Harvard? Where Where is the Institute for Advanced Study in this? So this is where it's a little bit complicated. So I'll, I'll try to simplify things. Um, my last year was kind of a crazy year. Um, what I did for my thesis caused a lot of excitement. So Joe Bueller, the same guy whose dissertation I was working on, actually came to visit Stanford. So we actually talked quite a bit about like, you know, what I did in my thesis and what he did in his thesis. He actually was the deputy director for a math research institute over at Berkeley. So he offered for me to come to Berkeley for the whole year. Um, however, Dan, because I was his last grad student for a while, was going to go on sabbatical at the Institute for Advanced Study. It's right there in Princeton. It's basically administered by Princeton University. So he was going to go there for the whole year. He recommended that I come with him because it was a special sabbatical year for all of the famous people who were working in number theory. So everyone that I had possibly even thought about, every name I had heard for the last five years was going to be there at Princeton that year. So Dan told me, just go ahead and come to Princeton. But remember, Joe Bueller also wanted me to stay at Berkeley. So I decided to apply to both. I got a position at Berkeley at MSRI for that I stayed at for maybe a month. I don't remember exactly. But then I went to Princeton for the whole year. Um, while I was at Princeton, Richard Taylor and I chatted a bit more, and he wanted me to come visit him at Harvard. So I went to Harvard for a few weeks, but someone else convinced me to go to Germany for six months. So the plan was kind of a threefold one. Joe Bueller really wanted me to come back to Berkeley for six months. So I agreed to that. Someone else who I had met, Don Zagier, wanted me to go to Germany for six months. So after Berkeley, I went to Germany for six months. Richard wanted me to come visit him at Harvard for six months. So after Germany, I came back to California, but I decided, let me try to get things to work out at Caltech. So at this point, it's 2001. I had worked out a three-year position at Caltech, even though Richard wanted me to come visit him at Harvard for six months. So I kind of had a dual position at Caltech and at Harvard. It got awkward because Barry Simon kind of pulled the plug on a lot of things and told me I wasn't allowed to be the, to be at both. Um, I kind of ignored him anyway and still ended up being at Harvard for about two months, I guess it was. So... The five years between when I graduated in 99 and when I got my first tenure track position in 2004 are kind of confusing. I was at MSRI for about a month in California, went to Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Study for almost a year, 
I then came back to Berkeley for MSRI for another six months, then went to Germany where I was at Max Planck Institute for Math in Bonn for another six months, went to Caltech for three years, but actually had an apartment in Cambridge and was at Harvard for two months. So, so I know it, it was very, very confusing, but, but I was having the time of my life going back and forth to all these different places. It's a flurry, Adri. I'm curious in what ways being at all of these top flight programs was great for the research, interacting with all of these people? And in what ways was it difficult because you weren't just staying put in one place for too long? It was great to see the world. It was great to interact with a lot of different people. Um, I, I liked how many contacts I made with people. I think even now for my career, it's, it's worked out really well. You know, there's a lot of friends that I have that are famous, well-known professors to different places. And a lot of these folks are people that I met when, when I was the postdoc traveling to these different places. Even the position that I got at Purdue University, I got it because I was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. Remember all the famous people were there. And so one of the famous people, actually two of the people who were faculty at Purdue were there also visiting. They were on sabbatical that year. So I got to know them for a whole year. That was 99 to 2000, even though I wouldn't even work at Purdue until 2004. Mm -hmm. So there were just a lot of great contacts that I made during that time. The downside was I got my first real taste of racism in mathematics. You know, I, I think being in grad school, I did spend a lot of time talking with the other black graduate students. I didn't spend a lot of time in the math department. There were still incidents that happened with the faculty, you know, so don't, don't get me wrong with the faculty in the math department. But I ignored a lot of it because I spent so much time with the other grad, black grad students at Stanford. When I left Stanford though, I didn't really interact with many other black mathematicians, you know, because I'm off doing number theory, traveling around to all these different places. I could see people being a lot more condescending, people questioning more whether I knew what I was talking about, and it just becoming more and more difficult finding people to talk to, finding people to interact with. I can't tell you how many times I was in a room of individuals, other postdocs, where people would just naturally go around the room to say, well, where did you get your PhD? And the conversation would always go, I got mine from Berkeley, mine from Yale, mine from Princeton. And I would turn to me, I would say from Stanford and the conversation would just die. Yeah, just people just wouldn't want to talk anymore. Um, other conferences where people would talk about kind of like the projects that they were working on. I would say that I'm working on something similar and ask, what do you want to collaborate? And the conversation would turn to not really, I'm kind of busy doing other stuff. You know, just, just these, these awkward things, but it was consistent. It just got more and more consistent as, as the years went on. Um, and even when I came back to Caltech, as opposed to from 2001 to 2004, it was bad and blatant. You know, some of the same faculty that I had known not even a decade before, you know, taking these same grad level courses, being the top person in the class, now people, the same faculty being condescending, saying, well, you know, I, I don't really know if you're going to get a job somewhere. I, I remember, I'm not going to name this, this person, but it will say that when I was an undergraduate, I took his group theory class, did really well in his class, was one of the top students. Um, I even did research with them while I was an undergraduate, you know, kind of working in group theory. Came back as a postdoc, and I remember in my last year as a postdoc, feeling really bad because here it was, February, getting kind of close to the, the end of the, the job market season, and I didn't have any job offers yet. And this same professor who I had known for almost a decade, just kind of joking, well, I guess you don't have a job, too bad for you. By thinking that's kind of a messed up statement, and it would be nice if you're a little bit more encouraging, but he just kind of laughed it off. It's like, you know, maybe you won't get a job. Oh, well. Um, and I won't even talk about like a lot of the other really negative things that happened in my last year there at, at Caltech. But it just kind of amazed me how everything turned in those three years that I was at Caltech. You know, people being very supportive when I was a grad student, being maybe a little bit awkward in the first couple of years that I was the postdoc. But by the time I got to Caltech, 
everything had totally changed. Just people being very condescending, very nasty, not being supportive at all. Actually kind of the opposite, you know, people telling me to my face, you know, you're not going to make it. You're not going to amount to anything. And, you know, just like just story after story. And I just got very shocked that all of this was as blatant as it was. Edre, if you can explain the obvious disjoint in the narrative here is that obviously there are gatekeepers who are welcoming you into these very elite places, Harvard, Princeton, Berkeley. And yet you're telling me the things that you're telling me among the people you're interacting with at a daily basis. So how, how do those things work together? All I can guess, and this is a guess because I don't know this for sure, is I didn't fit the mold of what they were expecting one of their peers to look like. Um, you know, I, I do have friends that we were undergrads together at Caltech. We all graduated with math degrees at the same time. And a couple of them are now professors at Caltech. And I could see how they fit more of the mold of what a typical Caltech professor is, whereas I do not. Um, and you can define the mold however you want. Um, I like to think that it's not so much the pedigree, because you know some of these folks they graduated from MIT, Harvard. You know I graduated from Stanford. I think it's more kind of the culture how you interact with people. Um, I don't interact with other Caltech professors the way that Caltech professors do. You know, when, when I made it very, very clear early on, I am a postdoc at Caltech because it is my ultimate goal to be a professor at Caltech. I told this to everyone who was willing to listen. More and more people told me, oh, I had no idea you had an interest in being a professor at Caltech. I must have heard that 20, 30 times while I was a postdoc. Um, and I couldn't really figure out why they kept saying this. Because to me, if you take a look at my resume, undergrad at Caltech, grad at Stanford, postdocs at Berkeley, Princeton, Harvard, why would I not be on the track to be a professor at Caltech? Even me being a postdoc at Caltech, people would say, I didn't know you had an interest in being a professor at Caltech, which always surprised me. But again, I can only chalk that up to maybe I just didn't fit the mold. So I can only guess that as the years went on, more and more people just didn't see me as part of that culture, being a Caltech professor. And so they were more ready to be dismissive of this concept of me being a Caltech professor. Again, I've never really understood why things happened the way that they did in, in those three years. But the two years I was a postdoc before I got to Caltech, things were reasonable. But in the three years being at Caltech, I just felt that the people, especially Caltech professors, were being quite unreasonable. Coming back, obviously you're at a different station in life. What had changed and what had not culturally at Caltech. You mean, say, um, now versus versus then? No, no. I mean, when you were an undergraduate to when you came after being a postdoc. I see. Not much. I, I really have to say it was pretty much the same place. You know, I, I graduated in 94, from my undergraduate degree, and I came back in 2001 as a postdoc. This meant that almost all of the same faculty I had as an undergraduate were still there when I came back as a postdoc. I think um, like Tom Apostle had retired, Wilhelm Luxemburg had retired. They maybe brought on one or two more new faculty members in the department, but all of the same people were there. Um, Dinakar Ramakrishnan, Gary Lorden, David Wells, Alex Kekris, um, Michael Oshbacher, all of the same faculty were there. Barry Simon, you know, he was department chair when I came back as a postdoc. He was also department chair when I was there as an undergraduate for some time. So it was the same. I can say the faculty never saw me as a postdoc. They only saw me as this former undergraduate that came back. So they certainly continued to treat me as a former undergraduate. Yeah. 
Um, one, one quick story. There was one student that I had in one of my class. She actually was, was a Caltech undergraduate. Um, she wasn't doing well in my class. And she came, like she basically barely came to class. She came at the end of class one day, like at the end of the, the quarter to say she wasn't doing well. Can she get some extra points back? And I basically told her no, because she wasn't ever coming to class. She wasn't turning in assignments. Like, I mean, she was just a poor student all around. I did have some sympathy for her because she was an undergraduate major in math, but still, you know, she didn't ask for any help at all the whole semester. And I wasn't going to budge on this. So she went to one of the more senior faculty members in the department and gave him the same sob story, that there's this postdoc that isn't supportive of her, that she had a very difficult time here in this class. And she's wondering if there's a way that she can get an extension so that she can do better in the class. So this professor came to me saying, you are being unreasonable with this undergraduate and you should change your policies and you should make sure that she gets a better grade. So of course I'm thinking here's a senior faculty member telling me what to do. So I back down a little bit and actually try my best to help the student. And I believe I kind of regraded a couple of assignments to bumper grade from something like a C to a B. Instead of this undergrad being grateful, she went back to this other professor to say, this postdoc is still being unreasonable that he's not being grateful or he's not being kind to me in this class. So the professor comes back to me a second time, kind of harasses me a little bit more to say, well, you should do more for the student. That's when I tell the student, I am not bumping your grade from a B to an A. I don't care what you say. I don't care how many people you talk to. And I was very upset that she was willing to go to the senior professor, but I was even more upset that this professor had so little regard for me as a colleague that he would essentially tell me what to do in running this class. But that was just one story of many things that I experienced there in, in the department. You know, I, I never was really seen as their peer. It was always this guy that had taken classes with them years before. Edric, to what extent, given that you were an undergraduate so recently, and, you know, it's always hard to shake people's association when they know you as an undergraduate. That plus this line not being a tenure track line, to what extent in retrospect were the odds just stacked against you? Well, here's the question that, that I always had coming back to the department. Several people in this department would tell me how much they cared about diversity issues. They knew that I was very critical in saying this department had never had a black faculty member, that they really had graduated no black students out of their undergraduate program, and that they needed to do something different. They, they knew I was critical about this when I was an undergraduate. Now, the only question I had for the department was, if I wasn't good enough to be the first faculty member, then who would be? Now, you could make the argument that, you know, maybe I didn't have enough papers, maybe I had not done enough work. But the question I always had was, if Caltech, specifically, I do mean the math department, is willing to say, here's a guy with a degree from Stanford with positions at Berkeley, Princeton, and Harvard, if he's not good enough to be here in this department, and if he's someone that we know, because we've known him for years, then who will be good enough to be at Caltech? I understand that sometimes you set the bar at some point and then the bar is gonna move. I get that, I understand it. It was more of a frustration of some of these individuals who told me to my face, they care about diversity, that they're fierce advocates they're the same ones that when I asked them, when I told them, I have an interest in staying here as a faculty member, that I got zero support. And when I say zero support, I mean one person in particular, someone who I had known from my undergraduate days, who told me he cared about diversity. He was department chair, and he knew that I had an interest in staying, and, and specifically the president's office, um, David Baltimore, was very clear in that he wanted to diversify the faculty. I know that there was a representative from his office that talked to different people in the math department to say, we want to work with you to make sure that Goins is going to be hired in a tenure track position. She warned me that this would happen. And I went to go talk to this guy who was department chair to make sure that it was true. 
he said that they were not going to read my application for the tenure track position and that when I get to be a better mathematician, they will consider me in the future. The same individual who told me just years before he cares about diversity and so on and so forth. So, yes, I do agree with, with you. I think that it was stacked against me. I just don't really know if anyone will be hired in the department if I feel that I did everything that I could, support from the president's office, doing postdocs at all these places, coming back as a postdoc for three years, trying to work in a department where people already know me, if that wasn't enough, I don't know if there's anything that will ever happen to change that math department. Andre, last question for today. Perhaps we can end on a more positive note. If we can just strip away all of the problems in the social context and just focus on the math, I mean, it's such a unique opportunity to ask you, given that you had done this whirlwind tour at all of these really impressive institutes, what were some of the big ideas in math at the time, at the turn of the century? What were some of the exciting ideas? And just in terms of your research, in terms of being a mathematician, where did you connect your research to those bigger questions in math at the time? So you may have heard of something called Fermat's Last Theorem. Mm -hmm. um, th there's this, this cute theorem that had been around since about, I don't know, the 1670s or so. There was a French lawyer named Pierre de Fermat. Now, I'm not going to worry about going into what the theorem was, but I'll just say that the rumor was he was this lawyer by day, mathematician by night. He kind of read this book to understand a little bit more about these things called dial planes and equations. And he came up with an idea of a result but he didn't have enough room in the margin of his textbook to write down the proof of said result. People called it his last theorem, although people didn't have a proof of this theorem. Lots and lots of people have worked on this for about 250 years or so. And then finally, there was this professor at Princeton named Andrew Wiles, who announced in 1993 that he had a proof of this result. It turned out that there was a small flaw in the proof. He had to work with this other guy named Richard Taylor, who helped him fix the flaw in the proof in 1994, so that by the end of the century, early 2000s, number theory was a really exciting field. People had a proof of Fermat's last theorem, and it wasn't so much the proof of the theorem, it was the techniques the Wiles had introduced. People could see that those techniques could be used to prove a lot of things. That's where I come into the picture. When I saw that you could use these techniques, even for this specific conjecture that I was working on, that's when I wanted to work with Richard Taylor. And then lots of people wanted to work in this area to learn a lot more about what these techniques were. So I'd say early 2000s for number theory was a really exciting time. There were just these techniques that were just coming out. People just wanted to learn about them. Lots of these crazy conjectures in number theory were falling right and left. Like you have the Taniyama Shimura conjecture that I think was solved in the year 2000. You had the Sato Tate conjecture that was solved in like 2008. Like they were all coming from exactly the same techniques that we also put out back in 1993. So the number theory world was really exciting the first 10 years of, of the 2000s. Um, that's the one thing that, that I'm going to remember the most is just like going to conferences and seeing people talk about these crazy new papers that were coming out, proofs that people were having of these conjectures. I mean, th there must have been maybe five major conjectures that have been standing around for about 100 years that all fell between 1993 and 2010, mm -hmm. all because of those techniques the Wells had put out. So it, it was a really fun time in math back then. Edry, next time we'll pick up on your decision to join the faculty at Purdue, and hopefully where some of this excitement in number theory takes you in the next chapter. So we'll pick up next time.